Um, welcome everyone to the District 6 Democratic County Council Forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters, Baltimore County and the Randallstown NAACP. My name is Erica McDonald, co-president of the League of Women Voters of Baltimore County. We're pleased to present this opportunity for the voters of Baltimore County to meet the candidates and hear what they have to say about important issues facing our county. The League and the NAACP are nonprofit, nonpartisan political organizations. Neither organization supports nor opposes candidates for public office, and both do not support political parties. The League's mission is to encourage informed and active participation in government, work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influence public policy through education and advocacy. The NAACP seeks to assure that African Americans, as well as all citizens, participate in our democracy as active and informed voters. A few housekeeping details before we begin. The forum this evening is a webinar, which means that audience members can submit questions to the hosts in the chat, but cannot pose questions verbally or enable their video. During the forum, candidates will respond to questions, um, but this is not a debate and time will not be provided for candidates to rebut each other's responses. Questions will not be specific to any one candidate. Civility is expected and candidates who behave disrespectfully, such as talking over other candidates, will be warned and may be muted or removed from the forum. Please note that no unauthorized recordings of this forum are permitted as it is the, the content is the property of the League of Women Voters Baltimore County and the Randallstown NAACP and may not be used without permission. And a recording will be available after the forum. Um, and with that, we are ready to begin our forum. I will be our timekeeper this evening. Our question facilitator is Nielsen Andrews, and our moderator tonight is Diane Ashenbrenner of the League of Women Voters of Baltimore County. And just give me one second um, to change the highlight. Just a second. And I will highlight our candidates as um, Diane is speaking. The Baltimore County Council is the elected legislative body and it is vested with all lawmaking power granted by the County Charter and by the General Assembly of Maryland. Tonight, we will hear from the Democratic candidates for County Council in District 6, Mike P. Ertle, Shafiq Kenton, Kate and Klim Kellner, and Preston R. Snedeker. The candidates will each make a two minute opening statement as well as a two minute closing statement after the question and answer period. The order of the opening statements was determined by the alphabetical order of their last names. The closing statement will be in reverse order from the opening statement. The timekeeper will give a 30 second verbal warning and announce when the allotted time is up. After the opening statements, each of the candidates will have the opportunity to respond to questions. Candidates will not be allowed to give rebuttals. We will begin with questions developed by the League of Women Voters and the Randallstown NAACP, followed by questions from the audience. We invite you to submit questions via the chat where they will be collected and vetted and passed to the moderator. Questions sent to the forum email before the forum has begun have been collected but will not be monitored during the forum. Our screener will review questions for repetition and choose for variety. We may not have time to address all of the questions submitted by the audience. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to the questions. Time limits will be strictly enforced. A timekeeper will alert the speaker when they have 30 seconds left and when time is up, at which time the speaker must stop speaking within 10 seconds. Our goal is to end the forum at 8 p.m. and we appreciate everyone's help in achieving this goal. We will now have the two minute opening statements from each of the candidates. Based on the alphabetical order, the first opening statement goes to Mr. Urtel. Well, thank you. And um, I think we all appreciate um, the League of Women Voters and the Randallstown NAACP for sponsoring tonight's forum so people can get to know us a little bit. Um, we're all running for Baltimore County Council in the sixth district. 
Um, I would start by saying I grew up in Northeast Baltimore and have now lived in Towson for 27 years. Um, with my wife, I have raised three children here in the district. Um, I know the entire sixth district very well as I grew up on the east side of it and have spent the other part of my life on the west side of the district. I always say my heart will be in the whole district. Um, I, have, I feel like I have the most experience as a community leader of the candidates who are running. I've twice been the president of the Towson Communities Alliance, which is the uh, neighborhood umbrella group, which represents most of the Towson area neighborhoods from Paring Parkway to Falls Road. Um, I was a proud eight year member of the CCBC Board of Trustees. Um, I currently chair the 4th of July fireworks um, at Lock Raven Academy, which is always a fun thing, fun thing to do. And I was founder of a group in Towson called the Towson University Relations Committee, which was formed to help ease some of the tensions between local residents and our growing university um, at Towson University. 30 also, I'm also very honored uh, by my involvement in the Optimist Club, where I helped uh, teach public speaking to middle school age kids and run the Shop with a Cop program for the Baltimore City Police. And for the last 30 years, I've worked with small business owners as a commercial insurance broker, helping them with risk management, employee benefits, and insurance solutions. Thank you, Mr. Ertel. Thank you. Mr. Hinton, you're next by Alphabet. Uh, good evening, everyone. And once again, uh, thanks to League of Women Voters uh, and the Randallstown NAACP for putting on uh, this fantastic forum for everyone to get to learn a little bit more about candidates. Um, so my name is Shafiq Hinton, and I'm a lifelong resident of Baltimore County. I also grew up in the district as well, uh, attending Fullerton Elementary, Parkville Middle, uh, played overly hard football my entire life and went to Eastern Tech for high school. Um, I'm also a husband, a father, a small business owner, and a healthcare professional. Uh, working in real estate, I work with families um, to help them actualize their piece of the American dream. And I, in healthcare, I work with stage three and four cancer patients uh, to help them find the right targeted therapies so that they can continue to fight cancer as well as um, extend their lives. I also, too, do have a strong uh, track record of success when it comes to community service. Um, as well as when it comes to uniting and inspiring people to uh, continue to move forward with their day. Um, I'm running for Baltimore County Council because I believe that change starts on the local level. And uh, service to people and community is something that's a passion of mine. Um, I believe in a few simple principles that have kind of guided my campaign. The, the first one being honesty and, and, and transparency. Uh, the second being reaching the entire district. Uh, district 6 is a dynamic, one of the most dynamic, diverse districts in the entire county, and it's going to take a very special person uh, to reach the entire district and ensure that every resident has their voice heard and also has their voices respected. I can uh, um, my other principle is to invest in our local infrastructure, which is our people, our schools, our communities, and our small businesses, as well as our green spaces. Um, everything's an ecosystem and it has to work together if we're going to improve our overall quality of life um, together. I believe that we can raise the bar for every resident in Baltimore County. And uh, tonight, I hope that you get to learn a little bit more about me and that I can earn your trust and your vote of confidence on July 19th on election night. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hinton. Ms. Clem Kelder, your statement. Good evening, and thank you so much to the League of Women Voters and to the Randallstown NAACP for hosting tonight's forum. A little bit about me. I am Caitlin Clem Kellner, and I'm a lifelong multi-generational resident of District 6. I grew up in the Overly Fullerton community, and I still reside here today with my husband, Sean. I'm a proud product of Baltimore County's public schools, having gone to both Fullerton Elementary, Parkville Middle, and Parkville High School. And I'm a graduate of Stevenson University with a degree in graphic design. After I graduated from college, my community association put out a request for a graphic designer. Wanting to give back to the community, I stepped up and volunteered. And that turned into a decade long role with various positions ranging from the board of directors to being secretary to serving as their second woman president in their 65 plus year history. During my five years as president, I advocated for issues ranging from zoning to code enforcement problems to school overcrowding. 
I even went down to Annapolis and partnered with state officials and testified for over $100,000 in bond bill initiatives for Lenover Park. In 2020, I was appointed the District 6 representative to the Baltimore County Code Enforcement Task Force, where I helped make suggestions on improvements to code enforcement. I'm also a graduate of the Emerge Maryland program, which helps train women to run for office. And I'm proud to be one of the 63 Emerge graduates on the ballot across the state. I made the decision to run for office after the 2016 CZMP session because time and time again, I have heard that residents do not feel heard by their elected officials. And it's time for residents to be the first, second, and third decision. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Mr. Snedeker, your, your opening statement. Thanks for the, thank you, League of Women Voters and NAACP. There's only one candidate, Preston R. Snedeker, who make real changes. I will fight for the children and grandchildren as first. The voters will come next and I'll reduce taxes through proper financial programs, which they don't have, and establish policies and procedures, which again, they don't have, to improve accountability. I am a CPA with an MBA in finance and real estate. I have experiences in the logistics, zoning, teaching, and telecom. I'm past vice president and board member of South Perry Hall Improvement Association. No other candidates have my depth of knowledge. I'm currently fighting corruption in Baltimore. I've already went to work. I need your support on Tuesday, July 19th in the primary. Get out and vote for the better Baltimore, for a better Baltimore, not part of the established political machine. I'm self-funding my entire campaign. They told me to put your money where your mouth is, so I did. Future 6th District County Councilman with your, I can move the mountains, believe it. Thank you, Candace, for those nice opening statements. Our first question, we'll start with Mr. Hinton. Question one. How do your skills and experience prepare you for the duties of the county council? Thank you for that question. Um, I believe I'm the most qualified candidate for this seat uh, because we have the most diverse background. Um, as we spoke about earlier, I work in both real estate and healthcare. Working in real estate, I understand what motivates families when they're choosing the, the communities that they want to live in. I'm also going to be very qualified to address some of the hot, hot button issues such as fair housing and advocating for more um, programs for first time buyers so that they can move into these communities that we're trying to build up. Uh, working in healthcare with stage three and four cancer patients, I understand service and follow up, which is a key um, constituent service when you're running for when you're serving uh, local office, right? Uh, all of us have great ideas, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of community members just want someone that's going to answer the phone, put up, the, put in the speed bumps, and fill the potholes, right? Um, we also have the most diverse coalition of support when it comes to any of the other candidates. Uh, we have support on the community level, the uh, state level, uh, labor unions, and, and many more. Um, so that is a reflection of our hard work, our work ethic, our vision, and uh, the trust and the belief of many people from every level that we are the ones that's going to get the job done. And lastly, um, I always say that the way that you run your campaign is a direct reflection of how you're going to serve if you have the privilege to be elected by the people. We are the candidate that is knocking the most doors and having the most conversations. So that simply means that we are the only one that truly understands what issues are facing uh, residents because we meet them at their door. And seconds. again, we have the leadership, the vision, and the work ethic to get these things done and continue to move Baltimore County forward and, um, and help people improve their overall quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Klim Kellner, how do your skills and experience prepare you for the duties of the County Council? Thank you so much for the question. Experience definitely matters in this job and I have the experience for this. Running a community association is like running a county council, to be honest. You're nonpartisan, first off. You have to set a budget. You have to work with your constituents on issues ranging from you know, your code enforcement to speed bump request to there's an animal issue. And these are all issues that the county council deals with. I have five years of community leadership experience with that. Also as a small business owner and a partner in my family's business, I know how to quickly think on my feet when needed. During the pandemic, when you have to go from that, you know, people coming in and out of your business to pivoting to how to make your business survive, I have the skills for that because I successfully did it. We're also out every single day knocking on doors. We've knocked well over 6,000 doors so far. Um, 
and you know we're out there meeting people where we need to meet them and listening to their issues so yes experience matters and i have the experience for this thank you thank you mr snedeker well i'm sitting here listening to them and the only problem i see they don't say anything specific what they're going to do okay i'm nba cpa okay companies and all kind of business at&t lucent westinghouse my father has a mainstream country company which he closed up but it's very successful Okay, I've had experience in everything, plus more than what you have. Zoning, zoning, I applied for zoning change. I've applied for this, applied for that. I hadn't been done a point, and I didn't do a major subdivision. Everything else I've done. Okay, if they want somebody what he's doing, I'm the one who knows what he's doing. I really don't have anything else to say. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Ertel. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have been um, part of, I've been twice president of our a group in Towson uh, called Towson Communities Alliance. And we have done everything there from dealing with overcrowded schools. When my um, children were younger, they were at a school that was at 150% capacity. We lobbied the county to get a new um, elementary school built. Eventually, the county, we found that the county had no plan and we uh, worked hard um, to get the school built and to relieve the overcrowding um, at Rogers Forge Elementary School. Um, we have a process in Baltimore County called CZMP where every four years um, property owners can, or, or others can ask for a, a zoning change to the property. I've dealt with four cycles of those. Um, they can be very contentious where uh, property owners want to put in a, a proper, you know, put in a zoning classification that's going to be much more onerous on the on the uh, community. Um, dealt with university relations in Towson. Um, dealt with a lot of um, problem rental properties. County council, as everyone has said, is everything from barking dogs to rats to it's all about quality of life for the citizens of the sixth district. And I've done that as a community person for 20 plus years. And um, seconds. I just feel like, you know, I've been sitting on the right side of the table. I'd like to go sit on the left side of the table and get some of these things done as a county council person. Thank you. So we'll move to question two. Ms. Clem Kellner, you'll be the first to respond. What are your priorities for the Baltimore County budget? Given that the county will receive increased funding from local, state, and federal sources, what would be your spending priorities? And are there particular areas of the county that you see as a priority for these funds? Thank you so much for the question. So education is clearly the, the biggest part of the budget. And I believe that we need to increase our teacher pay, give them the pay that they deserve for the hard work that they're doing, we need to work on adding pre-apprenticeship programs into our schools to make sure that our students have the skills for when they leave um, high school that they can come out equipped for a job. And then we also need to work with overcrowding with our schools and be able to update our school buildings to be 21st century ready and approved. Then we need smart and equitable redevelopment in areas that are lacking attention areas like Rosedale and areas like Overly, which have a community plan that has been sitting on a desk collecting dust for the past 10 years. Those areas need to have focus. Door knocking, I've been on streets without sidewalks. I've been on streets that the roads are literally crumbling. That's everywhere from Rosedale to Parkville. Those need to be a top priority. Public safety is also another concern. I've advocated for an Office of Community Engagement within the police department to help with police staffing. We need to make sure that our police are fully staffed. Uh, right now, there are precincts that should have multiple traffic officers, and they're down to one that stretches from the city county line to the Harper County line. We need to reopen our PAL centers and be able to provide transportation to them from the schools. And we also need to be working on when we include public safety, we never talk about the fire department. We need to be talking about the fire department because 
right now there are several fire departments that have not had upgrades in years. I toured one recently and it was horrifying. Um, we must make sure that that aspect of public safety is also a top priority. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Snedeker? My first priority is already said. Okay, I want to go back in time when it worked. Okay, I have a few years on me. Set high standards and fail the students. Now there's going to be an outcry. You're going to fail the students. No, we're going to help them every way we can. But if they don't meet the standards, I will fail them. Because the system now pushes everybody through. That's helping nobody. Okay? And the next thing about punishment. Okay? In school suspension. Don't let them go home and play around. Have a special place where you can stick them. You're going to do the work. It's going to be stacked on decks. That worked in the past. Why don't we try to hide something that worked in the past? Okay, the other, other things, roads are a problem, okay? It's not gonna be fixed very quickly because the federal government's involved in most of that. It takes time, okay? But I have a problem that I have to bring up. Massive corruption in Baltimore County. I've already sent papers to the federal district attorney. And I will be sending more. That is a pr problem that I've been working on. I've sent tons and tons of emails to all the powers that be, and I get ignored. I get a locked door. I get, you can't come in here. I was even thrown, not thrown in the building, but not allowed to come in the building and harassed, which was downright illegal. I'm the guy that's going to ask the tough question. If voters come to me, good question. I'll ask it to anyone. There's got to be accountability for all of us, including me. But guess what? I take accountability easy. I take it all the time. It doesn't matter. I'm an MBA CPA. I came from the commercial world. You get the job done on time with the amount of money you have no matter what. That's what I'll do. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Ertel. So one of the one of the major concerns I have um, for the county moving forward is that we have more poverty in Baltimore County than we've ever seen before. We have more schools that are have school underperformance where um, students are uh, graduating and are not able to do um, basic math or read at grade level. And we have a lot more crime than we've ever had. And um, on all these notes, a lot of, their, a lot of them are intertwined. Um, as Caitlin said, a lot of the budget goes towards the school system and, and that's the way it should be. Um, but we often hear from teachers that there's not enough mental health counselors not enough guidance counselors in the schools. Um, we're 130 officers short, uh, police officers short in the county right now. Um, we have, we've got to start asking the questions of how we're going to move forward as an aging county with problems that we have, we've been dealing with, but they're getting progressively worse. And one of the reasons why I'm running for county council is that I feel like leadership has to start addressing these issues in a realistic way. I feel like we, as a county, sometimes, I, I don't know that we're ignoring the issues, but we're not addressing them head on. And, um, that's, um, like I said, I believe all these are, um, are, are necessary for the long time sustainability of the county to address these um, problem issues. And, and that should be the priority of the budget. All right, thank you, sir. Okay. And Mr. Hinton. Ms. Diane, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. What are your priorities for the Baltimore County budget? Given that the county will receive increased funding from local, state, and federal sources, what would be your spending priorities? And are there particular areas of the county that you see as priority for the funds? Sure. Uh, thank you for repeating that. Um, as I tell people, I'm an infrastructure guy. That means we, we have to invest in our people, our schools, our community, local small businesses, green spaces, things of that nature. But it does, in fact, all start with our schools. So we have to continue to make sure that we're, we're, our schools are fully funded uh, so that we can improve infrastructure to try to get kids out of, out of um 
trailers. We've seen that the My iPass program works, so we have to continue to follow that, I believe. Uh, we were just there. I think Mr. Artel was there this morning as well at the uh, groundbreaking for Red House Run. Um, so we see what happens when we get new schools, how that energizes our communities. But on the back end, we have to make sure that people can afford to live in these areas. Um, so being in real estate, I, I will be able to advocate for fair housing and, and um, incentivize home ownership in the areas that we are continuing to, to build up um, on the east side of the county. Um, the other part is public safety. Uh, if we don't have safe, you know, school, strong schools are a reflection of strong, safe communities. Um, but we have to make sure that we continue to invest in all first responders, like Caitlin said. Um, I'm the son of a firefighter. Uh, he has 21 years of service. I'm also endorsed by Baltimore County Firefighters, so I understand the risk um, and, and the, that, that firefighters and, and police officers take every day when they put their boots on to protect our communities. Uh, they are severely understaffed. Their facilities are underwhelming. Uh, and with us having more women coming into police forces, as well as into the fire department, we have to make sure that those facilities are as well. Um, but again, everything starts and ends with our school system. Thanks. Thank you, sir. So for the third question, Mr. Snedeker will start. Question three, what do you see as the major educational issues of the county? How will you use your budgetary influence on the county's budget to address these issues? Well, first of all, I already said that, you know, I would have the school set up where they have accountability. Students will be failed, but they'll be helped in every possible way you can. The whole problem is nobody's held accountable. Push them through, pass them through, push them through, pass them through. Okay? And as far as specifics, I don't know that I know the specifics. You'll have to come up the one you run against them, you know, see what's the worst thing. But one of the worst things that happened with education, I'll hand this up here, can you say? They burned out the teachers and the nurses. And this is a time, wonderfulness health plan to help the people. You need to help every nurse and every school teacher and every administrator. They had a tough last two years. A lot of them were retiring. You have a hole that's this big, this big. Boy, guess how soon school starts? Weeks, not months. You're in a whole big problem. And I don't see anything being done, okay, by anybody should hold the school board accountable. You've got 11 people on the school board, I think, plus a young guy who's a student, right? Why aren't they being held accountable? It seems like they let that fly and let that fly, okay? But they have a problem. I don't know that I could solve it that quick, but I'll give it hell, okay? As far as the other things, you have to evaluate each one for what it's worth, okay? The education is get the school board working, get the people there, get people trained, have, have a massive amount of people to it. Take an administrator, right? One for nurses. He's going to get, go get the nurses. One for teachers. One for administrator. Build, build a team and make it work. That's what I do. And I would build it and make it work. But then again, it's a school board. You can't jump over the school board. It's a problem. They've got a wall there. They've got a lot of those smokestacks in the government. Smokestack here, you can't talk to them. Smokestack here, you can't talk to them. Smokestack here, you can't talk to them. I'll talk to anybody, anywhere, at any time. If you can come up with a better idea than I do, fine. If you can't, go with mine. And I do that with all the gentlemen and ladies here. Let's get it done. I'm an MBA, CPA. I get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ertel, what do you see as the major educational issues of the county? How will you use your budgetary influence on the county budget to address these issues? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry. Hope that doesn't cut into my time. Um, no, we'll they can start. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, as I had said before, um, one of the things that I think it's concerning to a lot of people is um, the we have proficiency rates that have been dramatically de declining over the years. Um, COVID obviously didn't help that. Um, with a lot of a lot of students didn't take well to online learning, but the test scores were declining before COVID, and um, we we really need to address that issue. One of the things that was passed by the state legis um, our our state legislators was the the blueprint print uh, legislation, which allows for more community schools, which um, gives a little more control at the school level. They're not they're not um, charter schools, they're public schools, but they, they give the ability to, to bring more resources where needed. 
So I think we need to use more community schools, especially on the east side where we're, we're really seeing test scores decline. Um, we have some, a lot of behavior issues in the schools that I've heard from a lot of teachers. Um, I have the TABCO endorsement and I'm not, not necessarily um, touting that as far as, um, you know, it's, it's just I've heard from a lot of teachers and um, they feel like they're dealing with a lot of issues um, besides teaching. And we really need to support the teachers in that role. Um, we need more mental health counselors in the, in the classrooms. We need more technical training. We're graduating a lot of students who, who can't do, who could really benefit from something rather than four-year college prep. And also, I think we need more financial literacy in the schools. Um, that's lacking. Um, so I'd like to see all that done and, and try to, you know, legislate for that. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Hinton. Yeah, um, education is priority. It's the number one thing we hear on the doors in every community, um, but it's a layered approach. And I think if we use equity as our ever guiding North Star, um, we can get there. Um, district six, as we talked about earlier, is one of the most diverse uh, districts across the county. So what that means is that some areas have schools that are much stronger than others. Um, so the goal, the mission is simple. For the communities that have strong schools, let's do our best to make sure that they remain strong because again, strong schools are reflective of strong, safe communities. And in other communities, we have to do our best to raise the bar uh, for those schools so that so that those communities can grow as well. Um, one of the big concerns with schools is, is overcrowding, right? So if we continue to raise the bar for other communities and other schools, we give families uh, more opportunities and more places where they can live. That in itself is going to start to address some of the issues of overcrowding. Um, with the blueprint that Mr. Artel mentioned, the county has the opportunity to match some of those funds. I will push to make sure that we continue to uh, have record setting funding um, uh, from the county council level to make sure that we continue to make improvements in, in, in school infrastructure so that we continue to have groundbreakings every year for new schools. And also, like we said, we have to make sure that we're supporting our teachers. Our teachers are leaving the industry at an alarming rate and they're also going to our competitors for schools such as Howard County. So that means our benefit package needs to be better um, and that we also need to uh, focus on having more SROs, more support staff, uh, more uh, special education uh, so that key teachers have the resources that they need so they do not feel burnt out. And then the last part is accountability. As Mr. Snedeker said, I have talked to families as well where their, their daughter is getting bullied by, by another uh, a student. As a, as a new father, I cannot imagine that happening. So we must have accountability for discipline in schools. It must, it must fit the crime, obviously. Um, and then we have to do the best to make sure that our facilities re remain safe because when we send our children to school, we expect that they come home uh, safe and whole when they return to us. Thank you, Mr. Hinton. And I'm looking here that we seem to have had quite a lot of activity in the chat room. We, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Clevener. Okay, thank you. I was like, wait, wait, don't leave me behind. I'm sorry. I, it's okay. <laughs> I beg your pardon. It's okay. Um, so I, I, as I said previously, I support increasing teacher pay because uh, we are losing those educators to other areas, and that is a problem. Uh, we want to keep the best teachers in our schools and help keep our schools with the best reputation that they have. Um, I also, you know, back to the overcrowding, we need to be prepared to, as we're building in other districts, have an influx of students and be prepared for the new schools that were groundbreaking to be overcrowded. So we, we must be actively preparing for this. And I agree with what Mike said about the mental health resources. I actually have a friend uh, that, that works with mental health in schools. And the problem is, is that they can't get mental health professionals to be in the schools. So Baltimore County really needs to take it upon themselves to incentivize for these mental health professionals to come and work in the schools because they're turning away schools because they don't have the bodies to go there to actually help with these students. That's a big problem. And as a county councilwoman, I would like to work to bring upon those incentives to get those mental health professionals and additional support staff in our schools. So, thank you so much. Thank you. 
So I am noticing that we're having a lot of questions come in through the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and try to pick a couple of audience questions before we finish all the lead questions. Um, so the first one that I wanted to do uh, is what role should developers impact fees play in funding public facilities? And the first person uh, should be Mr. Ertel. Mr. Ertel. Um, could you repeat that question? I'm sure. What role should developers impact fees play in funding public facilities? Okay, great. Um, so we have been dealing with this for a long time in the Towson area, especially, but it, it, it's all over the county where we have not historically had impact fees in Baltimore County. Um, other counties do, Howard County, um, Montgomery County have all had impact fees where developers have to pay fees to help um, build, you know, additions on schools, um, public amenities like parks, um, bike trails, um, walking trails, things like that. We need to do more of that in the county. We're, we're kind of behind the eight ball in that we haven't done this for you know, 20, 30 years, and um, we're playing catch up. But um, the problem is we have to balance these out, you know, public amenities um, with growth. Um, it doesn't do us any good. We, we talk about smart growth all the time, building where we already have infrastructure, but often we're building, we're overbuilding, and we don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. We've literally had uh, sewers that are failing um, because we're overbuilding. Um, we've had schools overcrowd. Um, you know, the, the traffic and congestion problem is there. We all see that every day. But um, we have to do better in Baltimore County. I'm not sure why we we haven't done that, but we need to we need to do more. Thank you. Mr. Hinton. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, Baltimore County, we should definitely look into having more impact fees to help developers who are already investing in our community, help to push our community forward in other ways. Um, again, uh, I hate to belabor the point, but our, our district and our county is super diverse and dynamic. We have many, many needs um, and they have to be met in different ways. So if people are going to be investing in our community, I think having a background like I do working in business, you can get a deal done where you can say, hey, if you're going to do this here, we need your help to support us here to help our students, help our green spaces, and make sure that we're uh, investing in our community in a smart way. Another thing that um, I think we need to look at from a development standpoint is redevelopment. Um, see, the market has changed so many times. Uh, we look at places like St. John's Properties back there um, on Middle River, for example. Um, those buildings are empty. Right. But we have a shortage of housing and we understand that since 2007, we have not been building houses at the same rate and that families, uh, both young and mature families, do not have places to live. Uh, those office buildings that are empty, I say, uh, instead of keep putting up the cubicles, tear those down and put up some walls. And those can be new buildings. If you look at the Industrial Revolution, um, when we had uh, warehouses and manufacturing facilities down in the city, where are they now? Those are apartments and condos. So we don't have to, when we talk about development, it does not have to always be about tearing down trees and um, overdeveloping certain areas. It can be re reimagining uh, and revitalizing certain areas so that we can give more seconds. families more opportunities or where they can live. And um, the only person that can help that is community members advocating for um, the right things and, and, and partnering with developers that actually have our best interests. Thank you, sir. Ms. Klim Kellner. Thank you so much. Uh, so impact fees are an absolute must. Uh, developers must pay their fair share. Um, you know, there's, we've heard time and time again about these major projects that have absolutely impacted communities, whether it be for the best or whether it be for the worst. And most of the time when you hear it, it's for the worst. So we must be active in making sure that developers are stepping up and actually contributing to the communities that they want to develop in. 
Um, these impact fees need to go towards improving the communities that they that they want to build in or are actively building in. Uh, it shouldn't go to another area of the county. It needs to stay within the district and stay within the community in which they are building. Um, and we are, as Mike said, we're far behind with other districts and other counties compared to this, and that's not acceptable. Uh, it's time for Baltimore County to really get with the program and and make those developer impact fees actually have an impact for the residents. Thank you. And Mr. Snedeker. You spoke of Ed St. John. I know Ed St. John. He's a very benevolent man and he builds a lot of different properties, okay? Did he give a bunch of property for a tech school at Barry Hall just recently, or is that in the process? Nobody seems to know that, okay? When you do this, you have developers. If you put on too much, they need to pay for everything. To scare the developers away. It's a very fine balancing act. Baltimore County is not the only place to build. Ann Arbor County is not the only place to build. I'm for having them do some of the repairs and some of the things, but you have to be very careful because it'll be an impact. Okay, you have to bend, you have to give a little. Okay, the things are, the roads are a problem, but then again, if some of them are federal, they have money and matching money, and that takes a long time. So you're not going to see immediate results on that anyway. But all I'm saying is be careful what you do. They can change the zoning law. If they change it enough, I have some properties, and they change my zoning, I can sue you for effective combination. You took the right of me to build on my property. You can't take that right away. A builder does have certain rights. The community has certain rights. We have to blend them together. And since Ed St. John gave you a massive amount of property, I think, for a tech school, it's kind of interesting you brought up his name. Thank you. All right. Thank you for those views, everyone. We're going to move to another question. Do you support the enlargement of the county council to serve the continuing growth of a diverse population of Baltimore County? And we will start with Mr. Hinton. Um, so I'm, I'm all for diversity. Um, I'm a product of diversity. Diversity breeds excellence. But my position on this has always remained the same. Uh, I would like to see more research done into it. I understand that Baltimore County has grown leaps and bounds since the charter, uh, since we got the charter many, many years ago. But our county is not growing at the same rates as uh, a PG County or Montgomery County that we often compare this, this um, project to. Um, the second thing that I've asked to see is a map. Um, I would love to see a map because we have to understand that Baltimore County is diverse, but the, all the communities are not. So we need to understand what communities we are going to break up, we're going to cut into, and things of that nature. Because what I would hate to see is that we do this, this great work to get all these signatures, and then we have four more of the same thing or even four more of, the, of worse. So I, I would support this um, initiative under the guise that I was able to receive more information, such as a map. Um, of the proposed new districts. Thank you, sir. Ms. Klim Kellner. Thank you so much for the question. I am a proud supporter of the vote for more. I have signed the petition. I collect signatures actually when I go to community events or even at my own fundraiser. Um, I am actually, they have a quote from me on their website. We absolutely need four more county council members. Uh, we're stretched thin as county council uh, members already with the amount of constituents, and we need more localized attention to our communities. Not only that, but Baltimore County is 53% women, and we're at risk of losing a woman altogether on the county council. <coughs> women deserve a seat at the table, and this is one way to ensure that that will happen. Um, when you look at Baltimore City, Baltimore City has a smaller population than Baltimore County, and they have 15 city council members. Why do we have seven? It does not make sense to me. And overall, when I've been door knocking, people are supportive of this because it means that they're gonna get more localized attention to their own communities. And that's what the county council is about. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Snedeker. I'm not too much for increasing the people on the county council. Okay, if they had defined jobs and everything's defined, you look at it and then we'll analyze it, not just say the city has more, the county has more, Montgomery has more. Evaluate it, see how you can come efficient. Policies and procedures are very useful for that. 
just to say, oh, we need more. I don't think we need more. Okay, and you haven't proven to me. Just prove it to me. I told you I'm mean, CBA. You got to prove it to me. Okay. Now, I guess I want to say a few things about the county council now. They have treated me kind of rough on a few things. I sent them an email and tried to share information with them, and they were very, not very accommodating, to say the least. So if you're on the wrong side of the county council, it doesn't matter. You'll be locked out anyway. If you have 40,000 representatives, I want somebody to, I want to speak up for the people. If you have a problem, bring it to me. I'll fix it if I can. But not more people. More people never help anything. Okay. If you're doing a plan, it's evaluated, and you know where you're going, and you know what you're doing, then you can do that. But not until. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ertel. Yes. So um, we have had seven council districts since 1955 when the population of the county was approximately 290,000 people. We still have seven council people and the population of the county is 850,000 plus. We need more council districts. I was in a group, a citizens group, an ad hoc group that um, put together a proposal for nine council districts back in 2015. And we presented that to the League of Women Voters and to the Randallstown NAACP actually. And they both um, agreed with us that it was the right thing to do. Um, these council districts are massive. Um, the national average for council representation in, uh, is about one in 85,000 people. So one council person per 85,000 citizens. We're approaching a one in 125. I also signed the four more petition. Um, I've advocated for this for almost 12 or 13 years. We've, we've seen this happen um, over and over again, where we are not electing a diverse group of people. Um, it's not enough to say, okay, well, if we have one more woman or one more person of color on the council, this seconds. Is, is, is rested. It's not. We need more council districts. We're underrepresented in Baltimore County. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to a next question. And Ms. Clem Kellner, you'll take, take it first. Um, the question is, how will you represent renters in District 6? Thank you so much for the question. That is absolutely a, a wonderful question to ask because Baltimore County is becoming more diverse with renters. Uh, I notice it in my own community. Uh, I have actually two houses right across the street from me that have multiple renters in there and they need representation. So I would like to work with, with different groups. And you know, if we, unfortunately, I, I need to research this, but if there is an advocacy group for renters in Baltimore County, if not, um, we need to create that group to make sure that their needs are being represented on the county council. They should not be treated any different than a homeowner. Um, and if anything, you know, we need to make sure that they are being treated fairly by their landlord. They need to be, they need to, uh, we need to make sure that they are not being, you know, falsely evicted. In this time of the pandemic, we need to make sure that they're not being evicted because, you know, maybe their job is still, up in flux with, with the pandemic um, or other needs. And we need to make sure that we provide a support system for them. Um, you know, I, like I said, I've noticed in my own neighborhood that we've become more renter based and we welcome them to our community association just as we would a homeowner. Um, and that needs to be the standard across Baltimore County. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Snedeker. They currently have a lot of policies and procedures in Baltimore County for renters. You know, you have to do certain things to the property, upgrade this and upgrade that. But there needs to be a voice, you know, someone that could call out, you know, do something about it. Our idea about have, having a group to do that might be a good idea, okay? But I want to use the established, what we have currently. You know, you have that double locks where you have to do certain other things, okay? And you can't evict them wrongfully. But I think they're already in place for not being used. And maybe you have to educate the people that are renters. There's somebody in the county that can help you now. Okay, I'm familiar with the county. There's a section for that. Okay. 
I'm trying to set something up where there can be somebody to try to reach out to the people that are around. So. Thank you. Mr. Ertel. Um, one of the things I would say, and, and Caitlin touched on this, is uh, I think one of the issues we're having in the county is we have more renters who um, are lower income and we need, I feel like we need more wraparound services for those people. Um, we've brought a lot, a lot of people have fled other areas um, to come to Baltimore County for a better life. And often um, they need help and, and often they're in, in places where they live, they're isolating because they've left communities where they, they had a support network, but now they're, you know, kind of far away from the family support network they had. Um, we, need to, we need to realize that and, and kind of help people. Um, I, I talked about poverty earlier, and this is not the same as renters necessarily, but I, one, of the, one of our challenges in Baltimore County is how are we going to help people get out of poverty um, become more economically sustainable and, um, you know, hopefully help some of these people become homeowners as well down the road. Um, there's nothing wrong with renting a property, you know, even if you do it your whole life. But, um, you know, ultimately, I think it's, it's a proud moment for a lot of people uh, when they are able to buy their own home or a condo or something like that. Um, but we, we need to support, um, better the people that are moving to the county and, and often are the, are the renters um, because often they're the, you know, first generation out into the world. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hanton. Uh, sure. So I, I, I absolutely agree. We have to have protections for our renters, especially in, the times that we're going through with COVID and people, you know, having uncertainty with their jobs. But one thing that we also forget too, is that oftentimes renters are renting from, you know, single unit or one or two unit homes, right? So every landlord is not a, a millionaire. Uh, so we also have to have protection for those, those uh, landlords um, that only have one or two properties and still have their own house as well. And they might not be able to pay their own bills either. Um, so we have to find the balance there. Uh, one thing that I would suggest to all the renters out there is to get an escrow account, pay your, pay your rent through an escrow account. If you feel like you're being treated unfairly or things of that nature, that can kind of prolong a process uh, for you. Um, also working in real estate, I understand that since COVID has pretty much exacerbated every <laughs> symptom of our country and our society, um, we, 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 have to, we have to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So, so we have to prepare ourselves for new homeowners. Um, the Dundalk Renaissance uh, actually has a $5,000 grant to incentivize home ownership and to help people buy uh, in the Dundalk area. I think that's something that county level, we can absolutely replicate um, for certain areas, maybe like Lock Rave and Parkville, Rosedale, areas like that to help uh, these young families or even people that are just in need um, take the next step in life. There's a lot of power in home ownership. And uh, oftentimes when we talk about fair housing, we never, ever talk about home ownership. Um, so we have to teach people and help them continue to move up the path as they improve their overall quality of life. Thank you, Mr. Hanton. Okay. Okay, excuse me just a second. Uh, another question about developers here, and this will start with Mr. Snittiger. Uh, what is your experience working with developers? I have 50 years of working experience with developers. My father did uh, missionary work for Leroy Merritt and at St. John. It's a missionary contract for 50 some years. Of course, I worked on the jobs, but anyway. And I, I found them to be benevolent men and special men. There are some bad men, but these are special men. Leroy's passed away, but Ed's still around. They're special men because he gave away property that they didn't have at Parkville for a tech school. Okay, he's very generous. He gave away $5 million but John Hopkins School of Business, Cary School of Business, 
you don't want to beat these people up if they're helping you. You'd be very careful where you're walking at, okay? And they're delightful people. And I knew them way back when through my father. And it was fun. We worked our butts off. And they're successful. We worked our butts off. Forget the way kids work now. They don't have an idea at all. He started out with ripping out both of them, ripping out cars and junkyards and getting property so they could build warehouses. Their money was tight. They were no different than anybody else starting out. Okay. Work with the developers. There are some bad developers do crazy stuff. The ones Johnny O seems to know are the ones that are doing weird stuff. Now, I can't say I had that experience. They gave money. They gave things. They gave supplies. They were very, very vigilant. And Leroy, by the way, said, I wish the tenants would come to me when they're having problems with the rent. I would help them. It helps everybody. And he got upset over that. How many millionaire billionaires know do that? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Ertel. Okay. So um, I've, I've been working with developers now for about 20 years. Um, as Preston said, there's, there's a lot of good developers out there. Um, I think really what it boils down to is we need a balance in Baltimore County with certain things. And we often need the developers to, to look at the bigger picture with us. And I, I hope I can do that if I become a council person to kind of show them a vision of what we're trying to do. Because ultimately, if we improve the quality of life for people while we're developing new properties or redeveloping properties, that's what we're looking to do. Um, it, it's, it shouldn't be a, a community versus the developer kind of situation. Um, we've, we've had many developers where they really dig in in the beginning and work with the community from the very outset. And we've had other developers over the years who kind of come in and say, this is what we're doing. And if you don't like it, hit the road. Um, that's really not the way to deal with the community. And, you know, and, and from a community standpoint, we've had people that um, where we've had we've had a few situations where we've had really good development where the, the community groups really believe in it. And we've had some citizens who show up at the last minute and 30 you know, seconds shout people down. So it's kind of on all ends, but like I said, it's really a balancing act of, of having good development in the county and trying to get the developers to, to help um, with that process. Thank you. Mr. Hinton? Sure. So um, I don't have vast experience working with developers, um, but I do have vast business business experience. And uh, throughout this process, this journey of county council, I had the opportunity to speak with um, many of those folks. Um, but what I do know about business is that a relationship is always like this. It's in balance. So what we have to do is we have to work with the, a good councilman, excuse me, is going to be have a great relationship between the community um, and the developer so that we can meet in the middle on what is needed. Um, as we spoke about earlier with impact fees and things like that, we have to figure that out. But uh, what Mr. Sendiker did say uh, earlier that is very, very true is that Baltimore County is not the only place to develop. Um, there actually is an article out there that says that that talks about Baltimore County being a level two economy. And what that means is when we're a level two economy is that we're competing with cities like Nashville and Charlotte. So when developers come here and they see the process to invest in Baltimore County, they end up leaving and going to our competitors. So we have to find the balance because what we don't want to happen is we don't want to see Lock Raven, Towson, Rosedale, Parkville, Middle River, overly start to turn into um, um, areas like Turner Station, where my family is from, where they're still trying to recover because they of years of the, the lacking of development. Um, so if I'm elected as county councilman, I'll, I'll use my, my skills, my business skills to make sure that, you know, the community is well represented and that we are having smart growth uh, that each community needs because every area is different. If you talk to the residents of Towson, they say they done. Second. They've had enough development. But when you talk to other areas on the East Coast, they wish that they had the things that the folks in Towson had. So we have a tough job ahead of us. And again, it's going to take a very dynamic individual to reach this entire district and deliver on the needs of each community. Ms. Clem Kellner. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, so my experience with the developers is through my community association uh, background. Uh, I worked with developers um, 
actually trying to stop them from building uh, a, a convenience store along Belair Road, um, and then another convenience store um, also along Belair Road <coughs> in areas that just don't support it. Um, and then I've actively worked with developers that I know through my business trying to get them uh, to reinvest in the Belair Road corridor. Um, unfortunately, because they don't see that the county's reinvested in it, they don't want to even pursue to have an opportunity for that then, uh, or to, to uh, pursue an opportunity to come there until they see that the county is going to put in the work as well. Um, if it's the question in the chat about um, how will you stand up for your constituents when working with developers, I believe that constituents are the first, second, and third decision uh, that should be the um, deciding factor with development. Um, I actively do not accept developer money in my campaign because of that um, aspect. So for me, I have an open door uh, policy when in full transparency where if I'm meeting with a developer, the community will know about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um. All right. Um, the next question starts with Mr. Ertel. How will you support school safety to decrease the risk of school shootings? That's a good question. Um, you know, there's been talk about nationally about less um, student uh, resource officers um, in the schools. I, you know, I disagree with that. I think we, we have to have officers in our schools. Um, we have to make sure that um, safety measures are followed. And, um, but, you know, ultimately, we've got to do something about, um, you know, nationally about what we're doing with guns and mental health. Um, you know, these problems are, are, are big and, and we should never as parents or grandparents or citizens have to worry that our kids are going to be, you know, killed by a gunman in their schools. It's the most gut-wrenching thing you could possibly ever think of. Um, but, you know, there's, it's a tough question. Um, we've, we've got to, We've got to do better of, of protecting these things. You know, the, we ultimately um, have to solve the problem, um, but it's it's a it's a long term issue too. It's not just the immediate threat. It's what are what is going on out there that are causing people to do these things, and it's a national you know it's a national dilemma. Um, we talked about COVID before. Um, I think COVID has caused a lot of mental crisis situations to come up. We're, we're probably going to see more um, issues around, not, not just in schools, but everywhere. And um, this is something we all have to be concerned about um, in, in this country and um, find ways to deal with it um, long-term, but something's, something's awry and it's, it's just a sickening um, issue, so. Thank you, sir. I wish I had, I wish I had all the, I wish I had the magic wand for that one that I could stop it tomorrow, you know, but um, it's tough. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hinton. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a sad uh, situation that we're facing in our country. And anytime you're talking about addressing issues of safety um, and gun violence and things of that nature, you have to make sure that you're addressing the root. Um, I think, so before we even get to that, I think we all understand that a lot of this is at the national and, and, and the federal level. So as council members, we have to be able to lend our influence and advocate our partners on the state and the federal level that they are passing strong laws uh, that's going to protect us back home, back at home. Because like I said, I mean, my daughter will be in school in four years and hopefully uh, we can do the work to make sure that the schools are safe for her. Um, but um, mental health is a big thing. Um, COVID has exacerbated just about every symptom of the United States. And we have to make sure that, you know, 
our kids are seeing the things that are happening in our, in our homes. Those things are being projected onto our children. A lot of families are losing their jobs. A lot of families can't pay for gas. A lot of families don't have food. Um, and when you are operating at the most basic human elements, you're in survival mode. So when you're in survival mode, you never know what you may or may not do. Um, so we have to address that. We have to, of course, have accountability in schools with the SROs and you know special education, um, uh, mental health counselors, guidance counselors in the school as well. Um, and then security measures just, just want to keep our kids safe. Um, and it also starts at home. We have to make sure that we're doing the best to make sure that we're, we see any um, any, any negative behavior that our children may, may be up or trained and making sure that they have the, the help and the resources that they need. Um, we're at the, at the point in our country where, you know, it's okay to talk about mental health. It's, it's okay. There are resources out there and we'll support you. And uh, working in healthcare, I'll make sure that I expand access or do my part to expand access for mental health resources uh, for our officers, for our children, for our students and our residents. Thank you. Ms. Clem Kellner. Thank you so much for the question. And unfortunately, like Mike said, there is no magic wand right now. Um, I wish that there was. Um, I am part of that generation that grew up doing active shooter drills in schools. And the fact that nothing has changed since I graduated from high school is incredibly frustrating. So we need to advocate on a federal level. We need to advocate to our state partners to make those changes. But until then, we need to have student resource officers in our schools to help keep our students safe. Uh, we also need to have the better, better mental health services that are available. Um, and we, you know, we can't shy away from that. Also, we don't teach proper mediation anymore. You know, right now, a lot of people, when they disagree, they just want to, they just want to fight or, you know, that's how some of these situations get started. And we must start at an elementary school level on teaching our children how to properly mediate and disagree. Um, there's been multiple studies done that say that teaching mediation can diffuse a lot of situations. And you know, we watch it on a global level of just how disagreements start and, and the name calling and, and all the issues that go with that. Let's start at basics and teach each other how to properly disagree, civilly disagree, and come out of that situation without turning to violence. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Snedeker. There are controllable events and uncontrollable events. The fact that somebody went off for whatever reason, start shooting people is basically out of your room once you got to that state. Okay, so you have to secure the school. And you're going to secure the school in it always. Okay, I kind of propose that you should have a citizenship grade for the students, how they treat each other on a report card. They know how to treat each other. They show teachers respect to do all things. So they held accountable for that too. Okay, now as far as in the schools, it was a tragedy when the 20 was done. I'd fired that policeman in a minute. He waited 30 minutes to go look at that school. Okay, I've never heard it. Get back to policy and procedures. They were shooting them in that 30 minutes. Okay, they have to be held accountable. What are they going to do? Okay, not think about it. Okay, I told you my father's in base three building. If I had a 10 pound slush, I could knock a hole through that wall in three minutes. I guarantee you it's blocked. Okay, what are you going to do to safeguard? And it may be off key, right? But they should know, have, have something established and know what they're going to do at a moment's notice and train. That's like firing. They train for all the kind of training. For when they get in a position, they know what to do. And it ought to be very, very defined. And also allow to think outside the box. I would knock the building down and say, my granddaughter, I wouldn't care. And it's sad that we're even talking about it. Okay? But if the kids are held accountable, teach them right from wrong, teach them how to mediate with each other, you got a chance. And I'm always, they would never do it. But show them a film of somebody shooting somebody. They have to be a certain age, right? And parts get blown off. Now that's savage. And I don't think the school would ever go, go for that. And I probably wouldn't even ask. But show the kid what it really does in Baltimore, what it kills somebody or wounds somebody. Or the guy's in a wheelchair for the next 45 years if he lives that. Okay. I came up when we had to hide under a desk for air raid, atomic bombs. Okay. They did do things. Okay. Might not have made sense now. But then it did. It didn't alter the kids in any dramatic way. They learn what they need to do. They learn their problems and their issues. You tell kids to stay off railroad tracks, they can understand that. 
The boat's just a little faster, a little smaller. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take our last question of the evening, and it'll start with Mr. Hinton. What would be your plan to address violence and crime in the county? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, again, when we're knocking on doors, schools and crime, those are probably one and two. Um, so the first, it's a layered approach, right? So the first step is definitely making sure that we're investing and in fully funding all of our first responders, police, firefighters, um, EMTs. Again, they are severely understaffed. Uh, we also have to make sure that we're creating an, creating an environment um, where we are able to attract new first responders and police officers, right? Because a lot of them just don't want to police anymore. Um, so maybe we got to get creative with our recruiting, our benefits package, um, making sure that they have take home cars and things that incentivize them. I think we can partner with some of the schools uh, to maybe have a, a program for, for young adults that want to get into law enforcement. Um, we also have to work on um, community policing, right? I think the Police Accountability Board is going to be great in helping us bridge the gap between police and law enforcement, I mean, and community members. Um, so that they can do their jobs both safely and with confidence, um, especially once we have them to get better, uh, more training and, and, and mental health resources as well. Because one thing that we've talked about a lot here was the mental health, but for police and first responders, um, you're not the same person you are on day one, um, on day 172. Um, like I said, my father's a firefighter. He, had, he has had to pull dead babies and, and burning children out of fires. That is hard to see and it's and it changes who you are. So we have to make sure that we're having constant evaluation. Um, I also would like to partner with community anchors such as the Chambers of Commerce, uh, the universities, uh, small business owners to make sure that we're doing what we have to do to make sure that both our communities, our businesses and our campuses stay safe by incentivizing uh, more security cameras, uh, patrolling um, and, and things of that nature. So it's definitely a layered approach. Um, again, we have to work, make sure that our schools are strong uh, because a strong school is going to be reflective of a strong and safe community. Um, and if we can continue to raise the bar across the county, it's all going to bubble up. And I think we can continue to protect and preserve our communities and for the, for the future of Baltimore County. Thank you. Ms. Clem Kellner, what would be your plan to address violence and crime in the county? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I also agree that this is a multi-layer um, answer and approach. Uh, we must make sure that our police are fully staffed. Um, you know, when we look at our office of, or the Office of Community Outreach within certain police departments, ones that should have five officers in it from the city county line have one. That's not okay. We must make sure that they are staffed. That's why I've been advocating for an Office of Community Engagement that's based off of the county executive's own Office of Community Engagement within his staffing to ensure that there are people that live and look like the community that they're serving in are out there reaching the residents. Uh, we have to increase our mental health services. Um, you know, our, the mobile crisis response team is the number one most requested a guest speaker from, from my own community association, and we must expand upon that. Uh, we also need to reopen our PAL centers and ensure that we have teen centers open uh, for our youth so that way they have things to do uh, because that's all a part of public safety as well. And I also believe that we need to strengthen our community associations because community associations are often the first line of any issues between crime that goes back to the police and to the county council. There are areas that I've door knocked that don't have a community association. So that to me is a weakness in a way that we can improve public safety. And I will advocate and work with those communities to ensure that every community has an active association. In addition, I will also work to strengthen the relationship between the state's attorney's office and community groups because Oftentimes, we go without that bridge when there's a crime issue there. And we need to make sure that that, that, that bridge is being met, and that's how I'm going to start with that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Snedeker? Could you repeat your question, please? Yes. What would be your plan to address violence and crime in the county? I'm sorry, you broke up. I couldn't hear you. What would be your plan to address violence and crime 
in the county. Okay, we definitely need police, okay, but you need to get more police on the streets, okay? I would look at administrative, how many administrative people they have and don't have or need, okay? And a good point was made about community associations. In my community association, we saw a crime statistics. If there was something wrong with that, we, we do notify them. You know, we talked to the police, had they come. That's a big issue. When you care about your community, you know, be able to talk readily to the police. I don't know if you want to do the state's attorneys. That's kind of a far fetch. I don't know about that because they, they, they're hesitant to talk to you. They really are. Uh, but, uh, but it's a community you have to go back to. Again, if you're teaching kids citizenship, it always goes back to the, the basis of everything. Their citizenship, they'll care. Although, only one thing I mentioned about firefighters, they have a fantastic uh, volunteer fire department on uh, Gulf Philadelphia Road. I think we should have more of that. I don't know who set them up or who run them exactly, but I want to find out. That is a fantastic operation. Okay, it's unbelievable all the things they do. You know, so that's what I'd handle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Urtel, what would be your plan to address violence and crime in the county? So um, it, it definitely is the number one or two issue at the doors. Um, people are worried about their safety. Um, we, as I said before, we, we have um, a shortage right now of officers. We're about 130 to 140 officers short countywide. Um, we're having, I think, nationally, we're having issues recruiting new officers. Um, you know, we, we've had this national situation where, um, you know, there's people that hesitate to go into the law enforcement industry, and we're going to have to figure that out as a um, society of what, what, what does the next generation of law enforcement look like, and how do they operate um, between police accountability boards, and, um, but also, you know, we have we know we have some people out there who are absolutely up to no good and are causing a lot of quality of life issues for other people. Um, I was in a community in Rosedale uh, the other day and there was a murder on their street where a, a person killed a son and a mother. And um, the devastation left by that is it's you could just feel the sadness on the street, um, but we have to address the root cause, causes of crime as well: mental health, family crisis. Um, I hate to keep saying this; there's no magic wand for it, but we've got to do better. We've got to figure out how we um, lessen the burden of crime on our society. And I'll end there. Thank you, sir. We are out of time for formal question and answer portion of the program, and we're now gonna to move to candidates' closing statements. We will do these in reverse alphabetical order. So that means that Mr. Snedeker, you are asked first for your closing statement. My name is Preston Snedeker, and I'm running for the sixth district county council seat. I guess I'm kind of a long shot in a lot of ways, but I have a massive amount of education, everything you need especially an MBA with a CPA. I define problems and find solutions for them. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm not medical, I can't fix people, but it's a business issue. I could dissect that 50,000 different ways and come up with an answer. The word I hate most is can't. Don't ever say can't to me or my daughter, almost forbid it. There's always something you can do. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be people. Sometimes a nice kind word may be enough. You gotta go back to simple things. AIS says, keep it simple, stupid. That's referring to me, we should keep it simple. We don't want to do more programs, more programs, more programs. Do the programs work? We don't know. We won't go back and investigate them. We'll just be there to the next program, and the next program, the next program, the next program. I care about the voters' dollars. I'm going to attempt to lower the taxes. I have a problem with the way you are taxed. You're taxed on your house. It's called unrealized profits. Even the IRS doesn't tax you on your house. Unrealized profits. Okay? So they get a windfall of money to count. And they usually mess it up, spend too much on the wrong things. I'm going to count it. Like I said, I have an MBA in finance and real estate. I'll do those numbers like you wouldn't believe. I'll make a spreadsheet, you push a button, all kind of numbers are fine. I'll write it myself. 
You need somebody watching the money, watching the procedures, and watching the policies. Okay, another thing I want to bring up, they talk about Inspector General they want to add. Baltimore County needs an Inspector General. You've got to have an Inspector General. But Amazon does not have an Inspector General. They do billions of dollars worth of contracts, billions of dollars worth of things. Why do we need one? We didn't have one before. There may be some corruption, that's all I'll say, with that office, Inspector General. And then you talk about getting somebody to watch the Inspector General. We've got an Inspector General, get somebody to watch. That's what the county does a lot of times. I'll fight that. I want the biggest bang for my buck. And if that voters will get the biggest bang for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Klim Kellner, your closing statement. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters and the Randallstown NAACP. Uh, this is a wonderful way to engage voters and get people involved in local politics. As I said in my opening statement, I've heard time and time again that residents do not feel heard when it comes to local government. Residents feel overshadowed by other districts or by the developers. And as a woman, I am concerned that we will not have a woman on the county council making decisions that directly impact us. Women make up 53% of Baltimore County, and quite frankly, we don't deserve to be overshadowed by the pay to play politics. I am beyond ready for a change, and I am the woman for, for this job. If you want a candidate that believes that residents and communities should be the first, second, and third factor in any decision made, <coughs> If you want a candidate that doesn't accept developer money and is out there to give a true voice to the people, if you want a candidate that has experiences from this district, from Rosedale into Overly, into Parkville, into Towson, and if you want a candidate that believes that the council should be expanded to ensure that everyone has a seat at the table, well then grab your chair and come sit with me. My name is Caitlin Clem Kellner and I'm ready to be your candidate and your next county councilwoman. I will see you at your doors and I hope to see you at the polls on July 19th. And now I'm so sad because Preston brought it up that we didn't get to talk about the inspector general. So I'll add, if you want someone who supports the inspector general without additional oversight, I'm your girl. Thank you so right. much and have a great good evening. All right, thank you. Mr. Hinton, your closing statement, please. Yes, thanks again to League of Women Voters, Randallstown, uh, NAACP. This is a fantastic uh, forum. It's a fantastic series. So I also appreciate all the candidates uh, coming out tonight and, and really making your voices heard. Um, as I tell voters on the doors, um, this is a critical election cycle. Um, and we cannot continue to fall for the same politics and the same policies. We need a dynamic person that's going to really reach the entire district and make sure that every candidate has their, their voices heard. We've been in many, many communities across the district from east to west, and we understand firsthand what are your what are your top issues. And as you guys can see today from my background, I have the most diverse background working in business with real estate and also working in healthcare with uh, patients, that we have the leadership skills, the transferable skills and the knowledge and also the work ethic um, that's going to allow us to continue to move our district forward. Um, I believe that nothing changes if we do not invest in our local infrastructure. And again, that's our people, our schools, our communities, our small and local businesses and our green space. It is an ecosystem and it's going to take a dynamic person to be able to approach that and address that and make sure that we are having equitable access to many things such as job creation, um, such as uh, housing, such as um, just quality of life me measures and basic human decency. Um, so I hope that you've got a better understanding of me. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to send us an email, uh, visit us on Facebook, social media, things of that nature. We're happy to talk to you or come visit you right at your doors or you probably already saw us. Um, but again, my name is Shafiq Kenton. I'm running for Baltimore County Council. And again, I hope to earn your trust, hope to earn your support, and I hope to earn your vote of confidence on July 19th um, on election night. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll close out the night with Mr. Ertel's closing statement. Okay, well, thank, thank you uh, to the league and the Randallstown NAACP again. Uh, I know we all appreciate the, the um, forum to talk. Um, I feel that Baltimore County needs experienced leadership to address the issues of our aging county um, that has more demands on it than ever for its resources. We have a, a myriad of issues that are affecting us, increased poverty, school underperformance, aging infrastructure, um, economic sustainability, 
uh, environmental and recreation needs. Um, I've been a community leader for 20 years. Um, I've worked to find practical and cost-effective solutions to the issues that our neighborhoods have faced. As a trustee for CCBC, I saw the power of that institution to change people's lives for the better. And we need to embrace more, um, embrace that and champion CCBC's role in helping more of our neighbors find uh, paths to personal economic sustainability. As an Optimist Club member, I've run programs that have enhanced children's lives and we need to do a better job of educating our children. And as a young person, I saw Baltimore County as a thriving and cutting edge county. Um, some feel that cutting edge is no longer a good description for our county. Um, I think it's time to get back to that distinction. Um, and I believe experience matters. I have that experience and I humbly ask for your vote uh, on July 19th and during early voting. So thank you and I appreciate the time tonight. Thank you, audience members, for your questions and participating in tonight's program. Thank you to all our candidates for participating in the forum and serving as an example of civil discourse. You've given Baltimore County residents a great deal to think about as we vote in July. I would like to thank our forum committee for arranging this event and the League of Women Voters Baltimore County and NAACP of Randallstown for co-sponsoring the forum. In the next few days, recordings of this forum will be available on the League's website and on the vote411.org site. Primary election day is July 19th, 2022. Early voting begins on July 7, and all voting ends on July 19 at 9 p.m. Vote411.org is the League of Women Voters' free online voters guide. It's your one-stop shopping site for everything about your local ballot, candidate positions in their own words, polling places, and more. Hard copies of the League of Women Voters' guides will be available soon at branches of the Baltimore County Public Library, senior centers, head starts, and college campuses. We hope that you will consider joining or donating to the League of Women Voters of Baltimore County and the Randallstown NAACP to support our work. Thank you all again for coming and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, guys.